Welcome back to What I Saw in 2021. This is part two with five more movies to catch us back up. So let's get started. The Vigil is a supernatural horror movie about a man who watches over a deceased body for the night in a Jewish tradition, The Vigil. As the night carries on, an evil presence makes itself aware and tries to wear down the man's sanity, written and directed by Keith Thomas. This is definitely a must-see if you're a horror fan, especially if you like the demon and haunting genres. The movie wastes little time to get the ball rolling. With its short runtime, it actually sets itself up quite well at the quick pace it goes at. Once you're in the house, the camera movements and editing mixed with the lighting and sound effects have you constantly guessing what will pop out or if it's just you overthinking. The movie for the most part also uses the environment very well. Being inside the house for almost the entire time, you never really feel like the movie is running out of ideas or stalling for the climax. Check this one out for a quick scare. That was a terrible crash. Chaos Walking is an adaptation of the book The Knife of Never Letting Go, a young man living in a small village on a foreign planet where everyone can see and hear each other's thoughts called the noise, comes across a crash site and finds a woman, which is shocking because to his knowledge, there are no women on this world. Now, he has to help her get to safety while on the run. Directed by Doug Lyman and written by Patrick Ness and Christopher Ford, after being rewritten by who knows how many other people before them. Well. Chuck this one up with Percy Jackson and the fifth wave of YA book movies that won't get to finish because they fucked it up so quickly. Chaos Walking is a mixture of too many things going on, not doing anything with said things, and a plot that is just not thought out in the slightest. The performances for the most part range from fine to not so bad. If you've seen a movie before, you can kind of tell the big secret of Tom Holland's village almost instantly. This is not a spoiler because it's mentioned in the opening, but there are aliens on this planet. I tell you this because they're mentioned and alluded to quite a few times and you only see one about halfway through and nothing really happens. That's the movie in a nutshell. A lot of things are set up or talked about but the movie just stays with its normal, straightforward story it's telling. Some interactions with Tom Hall and Daisy Ridley aren't bad, but you have some characters that feel like they should matter more but are just there because they have to be there if we get a sequel, which we won't. Certain characters are hard to get a read on in both how you're supposed to view them and also how the fuck is the villain's plan supposed to work? His plan is set up in a way that he wants to accomplish A, B, and C. He mentions how A will work, which will lead to C in the end. In the context of the writers and filmmakers, they know he won't make it to C. So B, the part that branches A and C together, doesn't really need to be explained because it won't happen. The problem is, when writing, you're supposed to lay out the plan so it at least seems plausible. If the plan doesn't make sense in the first place, we're just going to question that the whole time instead of worrying about what will happen. To put it shortly, Phase 2? Phase 3? Profit! First learned about this seven years ago. On a mission in Brazil to capture a wanted fugitive. When we got there, it tore through our unit in seconds. Mortal Kombat is the newest adaptation of the long-running video game franchise. This time around, we follow a new original character, Cole Young, who is recruited into defending Earthrealm from Outworld, teaming up with heroic warriors from the game's roster and fighting off some classic villains. Directed by Simon McQuoid and written by Greg Russo and Dave Callahan. This new installment is kind of what I expected I was going to get. I don't hate it. It's got way more problems than positives in my eyes, but it gets away with some issues due to it being fun for the most part. Most of the fight scenes are done well with that good old MK gore that the fans have been wanting, with Kung Lao probably getting the best kill of the movie. The effects are also, for the most part, decent. Some obvious CGI characters aside, it's not that bad to look at. The negatives come in hard with the story, however. Mostly how it doesn't really make any sense. The progression of the plot is just breaks in between fight scenes. Characters learn of abilities over time, until they need to learn it in 5 seconds after getting them. Sub-Zero and Scorpion are the coolest parts in the movie, but they don't really get to do a whole lot. And there's also certain language barriers that the movie never acknowledges, especially with Cole. He never responds to any of the foreign languages, so is he just nodding along with whatever is being said to him? And while we're talking about Cole, why is he here? 
Liu Kang worked fine as the main character before, he can do it again. If you wanted a more outsider main character that had to have this tournament explained to him, Johnny Cage is right there. If you want to focus in on the Scorpion Sub-Zero rivalry, you could have done that. But no, we get a boring MMA guy with a wicker sweater and police batons. Also, for a movie that constantly reminds you that the tournament has rules and certain people and events can't take place because it's not allowed, they sure like doing said forbidden things multiple times with no repercussions. It's a Mortal Kombat movie. So was the plot ever going to be the focus? Not really. But the fact that MK lore is so ridiculously dense, you guys couldn't find the good stuff to pick from and work with it. Mix of characters just doing dumb and nonsense things so a fight scene can break out and just move on to the next thing. Repeat for an hour and 40 minutes. Hopefully a sequel will do better, but probably not. Get over here! Minari is a drama about a family of South Korean immigrants moving to the southern United States and trying to make their way through this new life with a cluster of hard and depressing struggles that come with it. Directed and written by Lee Isaac Chung, who based his actual upbringing as the inspiration. This film is goddamn beautiful. It's so simple on the surface, yet just like any conflicting family dynamics, it's hopeful, depressing, loving, resenting, and all you want is this family to make it whether it's here or where they might end up. So much of the film uses action to display characterization. Dialogue is used when showing the relationships, but you get plenty of times of family members being left by themselves and watching how their mind works and deals with their problems. The son and grandma's banter and development is by far the best. You watch the family grow, and when certain decisions have to be made, you may side with one person more, but the other party has a very personal and kind of understanding want as well. I teared up twice watching this thing, and maybe it has something to do with the time I saw it, but I know I would love this movie just as much no matter when I watched it. I can't recommend Minari enough. It's so far my favorite movie of the year, and I can't imagine it won't make it to the best of the year list. Pretty boy. I'm not pretty. I'm good looking. <laughs> You're Mary Morrison, best selling author. I haven't written in a while. Deadly Illusions is an erotic thriller about an author who is brought back to write a new installment for her murder mystery series. So she hires a nanny to help around the house so she can get her work done. Over time, the tension builds between the ladies and our lead begins having trouble telling reality and fantasy apart. Directed and written by Anna Elizabeth James. This is what happens when Netflix says they're going to be pumping out new movies constantly all year. You get shit like Deadly Illusions. This movie tries to entice you with things from the trailer and the mystery of what could possibly be happening. I'm gonna tell you right now, spoilers ahead, if you hear that there's an erotic thriller about a new nanny coming into a rich family's life, then strange and murderous elements start popping up, the first person you guess is the person behind it. Of course it's the nanny. If it's not the butler, it's the nanny. That fact is what makes the twist so stupid in the long run. The movie plays with our main character with the mother slash author, where she basically can't tell what's real or not, and her emotions get out of whack when she gets too deep into writing. Multiple times in the movie, certain lines of dialogue and small interactions happen that try to trail you away from, well the nanny is obviously the bad guy, and point you to things like, what if it's the mother the whole time? What if the best friend could possibly be involved somehow? What if it's just all in her head? You will ask these questions, think how could that play out? and the possibilities are actually kind of interesting. Then the movie slaps you in the face, turns around, wet farts into your eyes because, ha, you thought it was the author or something else. But no, it was the first overdone boring thing you thought 10 minutes into the movie, you idiot. Also, the nanny has two personalities and that's why she's sweet and evil at the same time, because that's how mental disorders work. You can tell which side is evil because they have a monster voice filter on top of them while speaking, after not having one the entire movie until it was revealed in the last five minutes. If that personality shows up, just bonk them on the head and they'll juckle back from their hide. Deadly illusions. The only deadly thing here is the fact that this movie actually exists. You hurt me? That's hilarious. <laughs> That's the end of part two, and we'll be back soon with part three. Stay tuned.